Hello and welcome to the section Working with Scripts. This section continues to develop the skills that we've already been working on, working with objects and the pipeline, PowerShell commandlets and parameters to build more complex tasks. And this is another packed section. In this section, I'm going to cover getting started with scripting, installing a local Git repository, using branching in our scripts, adding loops to our scripts, adding some logging into our scripts, debugging, and then we're going to get into some advanced scripting items, including testing with Pester and using classes. Welcome to getting started with writing scripts. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the different file types that PowerShell uses and then discuss the similarities and differences between a PowerShell script and a module. There's several different file extensions that PowerShell uses, but the first one you need to know is the most common, most generally used. It's the PowerShell script file. It's a PS1. A PS1 is a file that contains PowerShell commands and it can be executed just like if you were typing in the commands line by line into the interactive session. A PS1 is the specific file extension that PowerShell uses. Now here is PowerShell code that's stored in a text file. And you can see nothing is lit up with the same formatting that we're seeing in other scripts. And if we tried to debug this, it doesn't even know what we want to use, maybe Node.js or PowerShell. And if we tried to use PowerShell, we're getting an error. On the other hand, if we look at a PS1 file, everything comes together nicely. We get our functions, we get our highlighting, and we can also interactively run PowerShell commands directly from the script. Now that we have a PS1 file open, I want to mention a few things about scripting in PowerShell. So the first thing is that semicolons aren't required, but if you do put multiple statements on one line, then you need semicolons to separate them. Second is that formatting in white spaces is pretty loose. You have diff some different options. For instance, you could use a for each object script block that starts on the same line and has multiple lines. You could also do the entire script block on the same line. Third is that PowerShell is really flexible in terms of capitalization. You don't have to have the same capitalization in, even in your same script. So commandlets and variables can all be uppercase, lowercase, or a mix. In fact, here we've got everything being saved to a variable called lowercase variable, all lowercase. And then we can output that variable, even though we've typed it in uppercase, the variable is the same variable. Now, PowerShell is forgiving regarding formatting, but readers of your code, they're not going to. Be. So work on having a readable style and be consistent as much as possible. Now, if you're working with a team, ask to see if there's already a company standard about variable names and formatting, and then adopt that style. If not, take some time to write down your style. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can keep things pretty simple, but just say the way that you're going to do your coding pass it around, show your team, and say, is this something that we can adhere to? Once you've got some agreement, publish it and then stick to that standard. Now, having a consistent coding style as an individual, it's really important, but having one as a team, that's appreciated by everybody. Now, I mentioned PowerShell can be very forgiving with your formatting, but Visual Studio Code, it really tries to help you along with giving you some good practices in formatting. Let me show you what I mean. You can use tab complete on a variable. Here we will create a variable just called create a variable. And you notice that we have create a and variable all capitalized with the first letter. Now, as I'm starting to type in this create a variable again, I get a suggestion and it's capitalized in the same way. That's going to help with consistency, just using the tab complete on those variables and letting IntelliSense give you some help. There's another thing that IntelliSense will do in VS Code and that's to suggest aliases be replaced with full names. And we can see here, if you just mouse over this green line that indicates there's something going on with the code, you can mouse over it and it says that it's an alias of Clearhost and aliases can cause problems. So instead of CLS, we could replace that with Clearhost. Now I'll tell you regarding aliases, I'll make a suggestion to you. If you are typing interactively at the command line here, you're typing CLS, that's fine. If you're typing DIR, that's fine. If you are typing any of the aliases while you're typing interactively and you're doing command line administration, go for it. 
but when you're writing stuff down into a script, get rid of those aliases. Be very descriptive with the full commandlet name. It's much more clear for readers and even for yourself coming back later on. You don't have as many translations that you're having to do internally to read your script. Visual Studio Code also helps in some other ways. As you start typing, IntelliSense starts to go to work. Let's look here at typing in get dash. We can start typing in and even if it's not exactly right, get dash info, it will start to give us help. We may want to be talking about get computer info or I N F O down here, computer info. Similarly, if you're typing your commandlet name and you start typing your parameters, it will give you some guidance here. It will tell you what those parameters are that it's looking for. IntelliSense also helps you if you've already got the commandlet there, you can just put your cursor at the end of the commandlet and press control plus space. That's going to bring up IntelliSense. It will give you the description of the commandlet and what you need to use for it. Another use for IntelliSense is as you're just typing in the white space. If you are pressing control plus space in the white space, you can see templates like functions, commandlets, and different items that are built into the IntelliSense and built into the PowerShell add-on that is, so the extension for VS Code, has these templates built in here. If we just start typing in func for function, it gives us some specific help. It gives us how the function is named, what, where to add the function name, where to put in optional parameters, and we can even do more here with comment-based help. So I'm just starting to type in comment and I can select comment help, which tells us everything that we could do for putting in a short description, a long description, and an example. And these three, these are what I use all the time. This, this is my minimum for help files. There are more advanced functions that you could create, and those are called up with the commandlet. So you just the commandlet template, and it gives you a function in the name verb with the name standard of verb dash noun. It puts in commandlet binding, it gives us a place for our parameters, begin, process, and end blocks. This is everything we need to create a commandlet style function. Now, we're ready to start scripting soon, but before we do, I wanna make sure we've covered everything we set out to cover in this video, and I still have a few file types left. The next is the file used for modules, PSM1. PSM1 files are used to create a module. Now, it's not hard to create a module. There are a few things to consider though. A module file ends with a PSM1 extension, and the name of the PSM1 file has to be in a folder of the same name. So this will become your module name, mine module, or whatever you have named your module, and inside that directory, you put a same name.psm1. Along with the PowerShell module file, there's a module manifest file, the PSD1. The PSD1 is a module manifest and it is used to describe the details of the module. Just like the PSD one needs to be the same name as the folder that it's in, just the name of the module dot PSD one. Now there's another use for the PSD one. As started getting PowerShell desired state configuration, PSD one files were also used to have all of the non configuration data stored about nodes in it. So in cases of using the PowerShell data file, the PSD one does not have to be the same name as the folder that it's in. That's just a requirement when we're talking about creating modules. There are a few other PowerShell file types that exist, but they're just a little too far out of the scope for this course. There are PSRC and PSSC, which stand for PowerShell role capability and PowerShell session configuration. Those are both used in cases of setting up just enough administration. And JEA, or just enough administration, gives us a way to delegate some administrative duties without giving away more permissions than are required. The PSSC files, lockdown PowerShell sessions, and PSRC files further define who can perform administrative functions. There's also the PS1 XML file, which defines type data. That is the extended properties and methods of objects. This is similar to using add member to add a property to an object, but instead it adds it to the blueprint for the object instead of just one instance of the object. It makes it part of the default property 
that PowerShell Instance has. Now, both of these are really cool, but they're just outside of our reach for this course. With the discussion of the module files, now would actually be a good time to discuss the role that modules play in developing your scripts. When you're developing your code and you're trying to decide whether you should use a script or a module, here are some guides. Now, if you already know that you want to use a module or you already know that you want to use a script for this, great, go for it. But if you're starting from nothing and you don't know which one to use, let's use this as a guide. Use a script when what you're building will perform a single function or a process and there's no parameters. It's just going to be point blank, start to finish, follow these instructions. Use a script when you're going to be running something as a scheduled task and use a script if you expect it to be run without any user input. Use a module if you're going to have multiple functions or commands that manage infrastructure or a process. And I'm not talking about a single running process. I mean like process that you guys are doing as a team, maybe deploying code or something like that. And use a module in cases where you expect an administrator to use it interactively, like at the command line. 